Joining me now to talk about all this, NBC's Shaq Brewster, who was at Warnock headquarters last night. He joins us from Atlanta. And also with us is Atlanta Journal-Constitution Washington correspondent Tia Mitchell. NBC's Mark Caputo has been following all things Trump since his announcement last month. And my NBC News colleague Ryan Nobles is with us on Capitol Hill. So, Shaq, how did Raphael Warnock pull this off? And what did you see last night at that campaign party? Well, you have two different dynamics here. You know, on one end, you look at the numbers. When you look at the county numbers and the county results, you see that Warnock, especially in this Atlanta metro area, he was able to squeeze more Democratic vote, especially in those counties that were historically Republican. Those shifts that we've been seeing over the past 10, 15, 20 years only continued to get worse for Republicans, and Warnock really took advantage of that. But you also saw evidence when talking with voters, both voters who supported Warnock and those who voted for Walker, you saw evidence that that closing message that you heard from the senator, that uh, Herschel Walker did not have the competence or the, uh, the co competency, uh, or it was competency or character, competency or the character to serve as Senate. Uh, you heard voters saying that that they believed the same thing. Even those who voted for Walker said that they second-guessed it or hesitated before casting that ballot, pointing to the allegations against him of uh, misconduct, the um, allegations that really dominated much of the runoff and the general election. So those factors all combined into what you saw last night, which was, yes, still just about a three-percentage win for Raphael Warnock, but here in the state of Georgia, that is historically significant, and you have Democrats saying, they not only feel that they got a victory, but they feel they overcame a lot of the efforts to suppress votes in this state. So they see it as a victory on multiple fronts. And that's what they were celebrating last night at that party in downtown Atlanta, where it was a raucous event, a lot of celebrations happening. It was a big win for folks, for Democrats specifically. In this we state. talk about campaign victory parties all the time, but that Warnock event looked like it actually really fit the bill. Um, Shaq, it was different. <laughs> yeah. You talk about, you talk about um, turnout here. Obviously, that's always key. But in this case, I mean, Walker clearly failed to hit his numbers. Warnock actually improved on his margins yeah. in a lot of places. What are you hearing from voters, uh, both today and leading up to this, about why they went to the polls for yet, yet another runoff election here, where the fate of the Senate wasn't at stake? Well, one thing is that they're getting used to this. They're used to the process of going to election, going to the polls on election day in November, then having to come back out for a result that people say is more significant or where there are high stakes. They did this in 2020 when, uh, and then came back out in 2021 when the balance of the Senate, control of the Senate was on the line. But on both sides, people said this time around, although they knew it wasn't about who was going to control the Senate chamber, that this result was not going to determine whether or not Democrats or Republicans would have ultimate control, they still understood the implications of this seat. They knew that there would be an easier pass for, uh, path for Democrats on things like nominations, on different pieces of legislation, if they got this seat. And I'll tell you, especially here in Atlanta, where we know Raphael Warnock has that deep history. He's a pastor of mm -hmm. Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, there's a deep affection for him. People like this man. They wanted to have his back. You heard that sentiment. I wanted to go to the polls. I was going to stand in line in early voting despite it being a shorter runoff period. I was going to do that because I wanted to show support for Senator Warnock. That is what drove a lot of people to the polls. And there's a question of whether or not that passion was there on the other side, especially when you look at those county maps and the shift in vote from the general election to the runoff election, Garrett. It's not rocket science, but sometimes the parties forget this. If you run likable people, folks want to go vote for them. Uh, you know, they, they, I get to make big bucks as a political consultant. Um, Tia, you know, Shaq teed this up here a little bit, talking about some of the uh, similarities, some of the differences in this runoff from what we saw in 2021. But what did you see as the big differences here from that last, uh, you know, kind of nation-grabbing runoff election that we saw in early 2021 in Georgia? Well, some of the difference were just by mechanics of that runoff window being condensed. Mm -hmm. So the fewer days for early voting, a big difference was after they condensed the runoff window, fewer days of early voting, but then that lawsuit over whether early voting would be available the Saturday after Thanksgiving, that did two things. Number one, it enraged Democrats. It really fired up their base, made them even more um, you know, intent on participating in the runoff, but it also furthermore helped Raphael Warnock kind of bank early voting votes. So he came even stronger into election day. 
I also think this runoff, like Chad just mentioned, Georgia voters are now used to it. They're ready for runoffs. Yes, they're over all the ads and the texts and the emails, but they were very engaged, this runoff campaign. And then it came down to which candidate was able to rile up their base and connect with their base. And we saw that Warnock not only had a more consistent message where he really talked about competence and character, as Shaq mentioned, but Warnock had a clear runoff strategy where he was speaking to so many different segments, and that really paid off. Talk about the difference here between uh, Warnock and Brian Kemp. You know, he didn't, or, I'm sorry, Walker and Brian Kemp. Eh? Yeah, the two did not engage with each other in the lead up to Election Day. Kemp came in late trying to help Walker get over the finish line. Do we think Kemp really believed that he could get Walker there? And if not, was you know campaigning with him, engaging with him just a way to say, look, I tried to do something here to help? Yeah, I think if nothing else, Kemp needed to check that box because he is the leader of the Republican Party in Georgia. He wants to remain in the good graces of national Republican leaders. And I think he wants to keep his options open for his political future. So, you know, he lent his campaign apparatus to the Walker campaign. He did do one public appearance, but he also helped raise funds and recorded some ads. So he checked all the boxes. I don't know. You know, there's nothing that indicated they ever forged a real relationship. There's mm -hmm. nothing that indicated that they that Kemp really was all in on Herschel Walker as a candidate, as an individual. Even his message when he campaigned for Herschel Walker was about that broader strategy of putting another Republican in the Senate as kind of a check on President Joe Biden. Right. So if Kemp's hands are clean-ish, Mark Caputo, Donald Trump's are certainly not. And look, these three weeks for him have gone just about as badly as a campaign can go, right? He's had his personal controversies. He's now a political loser once again. What is Trump world thinking about their hand-picked candidate here going down in flames? Yeah, well, it's another day ending in why. <laughs> this is a candidate who's made out of asbestos, so he catches fire frequently and yet doesn't burn. Mm. So, you know, there's a conflagration in Trump world. How does that differ from any other day when he was president or when he was running for president, whether it was in 2020 or 2016? The campaign is built in such a way where they just accept Donald Trump is Donald Trump, weird stuff is going to happen, and they need to basically have two campaigns, one where the candidate is going to do his thing and the other where the campaign is going to have to clean up around him and also just create a superstructure of actual competency, where, for instance, they hire early state staff and they just make sure to hit their targets. You know, kind of related to the Georgia Senate runoff here, the Democrats smoked the Republicans in early voting. And Republicans are starting to wake up to the fact like, oh, my God, this is bad. And one of the reasons this is bad is because Donald Trump kind of told people kind of, don't, well, don't vote by mail. Yeah. And early voting is kind of bad as well. And now you're even hearing voices on Fox like, oh, my God, this is a problem. Now, that's kind of like the hot dog guy meme where it's like, oh, my God, you know, who crashed my hot dog car? Right. Well, it's President Trump or former President Trump who did. But those conversations are now happening. Now, we don't want to Does... overestimate what damage there is to Donald Trump because the reality is, He's still running. He's still unopposed. You look at the polling. He's still on top in the Republican Party. How long is that polling going to hold like this? How long is that going to stay? I don't know. But right now, that's where it is. But, Mark, you could argue that Georgia undermines kind of both of the things that makes <laughs> totally. Donald Trump the kind of post-presidency kingmaker that he wants to be, right? He couldn't crush his enemy, Brian Kemp, and he couldn't mm -hmm. get his hand-picked candidate across the finish line. So if he can't do either of those things, what's the benefit of a Trump endorsement? What's anybody else in the party got to be afraid of? Well, to, to kind of use the argument that folks in Trump world are saying is they're, they're acknowledging Georgia's a problem, but they're kind of saying it's an isolated problem, right? Like that, like there's Georgia and then there's the rest of the nation. But the reality is, is in a few cases, Donald Trump got behind three Senate candidates who were pretty troubled and none so troubled as Herschel Walker. And in the end, though, this campaign did rest or fall or rise or fall on Herschel Walker's back. He had so much baggage, it was luggage. Uh, he got vastly outspent, in part because it was easier for Warnock to raise money from his base that liked him 
it was harder for Walker because his base had a lot of questions about him. If there's a path for a Republican to become president of the United States without winning Georgia, I'd be very interested to see the electoral map on there for them to call that a small problem. But that's a topic for another show, Mark. Um, Ryan, take us inside what I imagine is a pretty good mood there on Capitol Hill for <laughs> Senate Democrats today. Yeah, you know, Garrett, uh, the names that we don't often hear uh, kind of in the postmortem of these elections are the members that run the campaign committees on the winning side, right? Mm. Uh, everybody rushes to kind of pillar uh, those who run the, ca the campaign committees on the side that loses, which is why you hear Rick Scott of Florida's name brought up over and over again. But a guy that a lot of people aren't talking about is Gary Peters from Michigan, who ran the Democratic Senate campaign arm. And I, and I read a stat today that this was the most successful defense of a, a party in power in a midterm year that held the White House since 1934. So it really was a remarkable accomplishment for Democrats. And Gary Peters talked about it a little bit today, and, and he says his assessment of all this, he seems to know exactly why he thinks Democrats won. We knew we could win in a tough environment, uh, that, but that was the bad news. It was a tough environment. The good news is it was clear the American people really don't like Republicans that much. I mean, that was clear in all of our research. They were saying they don't offer anything positive. They talk about the problems, but we all know the problems. You saw the ads during the campaign. Inflation's an issue. And the American public said, yeah, we know that. We go to the grocery store. We know it's an issue. Tell us what you're actually going to do about it. They never said what they would actually do about it. And, Gary, you know as well as anyone that Gary Peters is not very hyperbolic. He's not somebody that's going to send out a, a tweet that's going to go around the world. Uh, he's very methodical, and, and he and his team were very methodical throughout this entire process, never too high or never too low. They had a strategy. They implemented that strategy, and it clearly worked. And I think the name Gary Peters is one that we're going to hear a, a lot in the future, especially because he comes from a very important swing state. So not out of the realm of possibility that he could be a presidential candidate at at some point down the road. Wow, now you're we're minting multiple Democratic presidential aspirants on this show. Um, Ryan, so what's the difference between 51 and 50, right? This moves the balance of power in the Senate ever so slightly to the left, does it not? I mean, now if you can, for people who are tired of hearing all of us in, in the political news talk about Joe Manchin, we're going to be talking about Joe Manchin a little bit less in the next Congress? We should. Uh, you know, there's obviously <laughs> two Democrats that uh, caused Chuck Schumer uh, heartburn, and that's... Uh, Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin, so they're not completely clear of it. But, Garrett, there's no doubt that this gives Schumer breathing room on, on a lot of fronts. Just from kind of a process standpoint, this uh, gets them to a situation where they don't have to call Kamala Harris up to break a tie uh, every single time uh, there's a close margin. They're going to uh, uh, gonna be in a much better position to push through a lot of judicial nominees uh, from the Biden administration to, to rubber stamp uh, his cabinet appointments. And then, you know, at a granular level, it is going to change the committee structure some. Right now, because of this 50-50 Senate, it is an even, uh, you know, amount of members in every single committee. Right. So that means it's a lot more difficult for them to do things like issue subpoenas and things along those lines. They'll now have clear majorities on all of those committees. So that's going to really change the scope of the way uh, the Senate does business. I feel like the combination of losing the House and expanding the majority in the Senate means a whole lot of time spent on judicial nominees in 2023. We'll have that to look forward to. Uh, Shaq, Tia, Mark, and Ryan, thank you all for your reporting and analysis. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.